Hello and welcome to the 741 channel. Thank you for stopping by. Today we've got another product review from an Amazon seller. So let's open this up and take a look and see what's inside. So you can see the item in question is a Wi-Fi endoscope. Now when I think of the word endoscope, I usually think of the thing that the doctor would use to stick down your throat or your nose. Um, and I guess this is really the same thing, although I wouldn't use this thing for that purpose. This is more useful for looking in pipes or behind objects that you can't otherwise see. So let's take a look at this and uh, see what it can do. So let's take the endoscope out of the box here and see what we have. So in the box we have this, which appears to be the Wi-Fi unit. And we have the cable with the camera itself. And you can see it's a pretty small little camera. So here we have a package of hardware with some various attachments. So before I get started with looking through the instructions and getting software loaded and set up and that sort of a thing, what I think I'm going to do is plug this in and charge it. Now it did come uh, somewhat charged anyway, I was able to turn it on. So I figured since I was going to be spending some time with the instructions and the software, that would be a good time to just let this charge up. So I'm going to use the supplied charging cable and plug that into the port with the lightning bolt on it, or the one that's furthest away from the power switch. I've got the other end of the charging cable plugged into a regular phone charger that will accept a USB plug. But I expect that you could probably use a PC or some other USB enabled device that has enough power to charge, say like a cell phone, to charge this as well. So anyway, let's, let, let's set this aside, let it charge for a bit, and take a look at the instructions. As you can see from the instructions here, you can run this endoscope using either an iPhone, an Android powered phone, or a Windows PC. I'm going to go ahead with the Windows PC setup first and see how that works. From the Windows instructions, the first step here is to go get the software that's listed at this location here. Or you can scan the QR code if you have that uh, capability. Let's go to that website on my laptop here and see what happens. So I'm going to navigate to the website in the instructions here. So once I get that typed in correctly and hit enter, you can see down here that the software is starting to download. And your results on the time of this may vary depending on where you are. I presume this is going straight to China to pull this software down. So um, depending on your internet connection and your proximity to China, that may affect your download speed. So now that the file is downloaded, I'm going to go to Show in Folder, and I'm going to move this to another folder on my hard drive. I'll probably put it in Program Files, and I'm going to make a new folder. And I'll call it Moco Viewer. I'll go in there and I will paste the file into this location. So now that that copied over and extracted, I'm going to go into the Moco View Windows folder and then I'll double click and go into the App folder. And then from here, I'm going to double click on the PCVideo.exe program. And you can see I get a security alert warning me or asking me if I want to run this program and allow it access to my computer. And I'm going to do that against my better judgment. And you can see the app is up and running. Now I've previously installed this app and uninstalled it. And presumably it's set some kind of registry setting or something. But if yours comes up looking like this when you first get it. In other words, if you have all Chinese characters up there, you just need to go to the appropriate pull down. I think it's the second from the last one and choose English and then everything will change over to English. Now that we have the app up and running, let's go back to the camera and finish the setup over there. Step two from the instructions is to turn the unit on 
and let it initialize. So I'll push and hold the power button for a couple of seconds. You can see the red light starts to flash. Okay, so I've tried this a couple of times now and it looks like it's not working properly. I had this working last night and as soon as I turned it on the red light would flash and the green light would sort of start to come on and then once it was on steady everything was okay. But it, now it doesn't seem to be working. The red light just flashes rapidly like this for about 10 seconds or so and then it just kind of shuts itself off. So there you go. I'm not sure what's going on there. So I think what I'm going to try is I'm going to connect this to the charger just to give it power and I'm going to turn it on that way and you can see that the green light comes on and the red light flashes slowly. I believe that's the normal behavior. Let's go ahead and use it like this anyway. So the next thing to do is to set up the Wi-Fi connection between the computer and the Wi-Fi interface of the camera. So you can see over here I've got my Wi-Fi uh, setup dialog box up and I've got a piece of tape over my primary network just for security reasons here. But anyway you can see down here the secondary option is the uh, Wi-Fi unit for the camera. This is the name of the network. So what I'm going to do is click on that and then choose the connect button. And you can see the computer is trying to connect. Now I've previously entered the password for this so um, I don't have to enter it this time but if you were prompted for a password or a network key uh, as listed in the instructions that password is just one two three four five six seven eight. So once you enter that in you should be able to connect. And you may be able to see in the camera down here, I am connected to this network with this sort of name, but there's no internet access, obviously. This is just for the camera. So I think we're ready to connect the camera itself and see if we can see some images. So here's a look at the camera itself. You can see that the camera is in the middle, and then there's a ring of LEDs around the outside. You can see that the camera body itself is some kind of metal, probably aluminum. And then it's on sort of a semi-stiff wire so that it'll, it'll kind of flex and everything, but it'll hold its shape once you unravel it. So that'll be useful for kind of guiding it into different places. So I've got mine coiled up as it was supplied in the original packaging still, just so that I don't get it everywhere here. This still just makes it easier for me to handle at the moment. I believe the overall length on this is three and a half meters as supplied by the vendor. And then you can see over here is a USB mini connector. And this connector is what we will plug into the Wi-Fi unit over here. So once we plug that in, the camera should be connected and we should be ready to start receiving some images on the screen here. So what I'll do now is go up to the video pull down and choose connect. And we just wait a few seconds there and you can see that we are now connected to the camera. And you can see I'm getting an image here of my room. So as you may have noticed, the camera is a little bit slow to refresh as I move it around. And I'm not sure if that's due to the camera itself or the Wi-Fi connection or the PC. The PC is kind of an older model that I rescued, believe it or not, from my local recycling center and fixed it up. So it's really not the best thing in the world, but it seems to be working okay once I have the camera stable. You can see the image is pretty clear. It's not the best picture in the world, but for what this is, it's not bad. Okay, now the other thing that I've done is now that I've got it up and running, I disconnected it from the USB charger and it seems to be okay now. I'm not sure why we couldn't get that green light to start initially, but it's okay now. So I can move it around and I could presumably bring this around uh, anywhere within a reasonable distance to the uh, computer and still have a wireless connection. In fact, let's try it out. Let me go a few feet away and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm about 10 or 12 feet away from the computer now. And you can see everything seems to still be working more or less the same way it was when I was right next to the computer. So the Wi-Fi connection is working. Let me go a little bit further away and we'll see what happens. Uh. 
So I went about 35 or 40 feet away on the other side of the cellar here. And as you could see, it was still working. The lighting might not have been the best over there, so the picture quality might not have been too good, but um, it was still connected and still transmitting an image. So that's pretty good. Before we go any further, let me show you how to turn on the LEDs that are on the camera. You can see that there's a box here with a thumb wheel on it. And you may be able to see on the thumb wheel there is a plus and minus and sort of an arrow there. And simply turning that adjusts the brightness of the LEDs. You can see that's max brightness there. And we can turn those down all the way and it turns them off. So we've got a pretty good control on the brightness of the LEDs. Now these LEDs are not the brightest LEDs that I've ever seen, but they should do an adequate job. So let's test this thing out the way that it was intended to be used. I'm going to put the scope inside of this old radio. This is an old Drake R4B receiver. Um, I can kind of see in there through the top cover, but let's for argument's sake say that I can't. And I want to put the endoscope in there to kind of look around and see what's in there. So let's turn this around and uh, get the scope in there and see what happens. Okay, so let's give this thing a try. I've got the LEDs up to maximum brightness. Now, of course, I don't have the orientation controlled quite the right way, but let's sneak this in here and see what we see. So get some dusty tubes in there. And let's see. That's the back of the dial light, I believe. Yeah, you can see the LED is reflecting on it. So there's a good image of the back of the tuning control. And you can see as I turn it, I could inspect the ball bearings that are on it. You know, not the clearest picture in the world, but it'll give you an idea of what's going on in there if you can't otherwise see. Now one thing I've noticed with this is we can't get too close to items. You can see it won't focus on it. But as long as we stay a few centimeters away, it seems to work okay. So underneath the main chassis, let me see if I can show it there, you can see there's a hole that should be just big enough for this to go into. Let's see what we can see. And it looks pretty dark. Let me turn those LEDs on. And we have light. So let's see how far in we can get with this and if we can see anything useful. So, well, it looks like I can't really get in any further than that. There's something in the way there blocking it. But, at least we can kind of see in there. Oh, no, oh, I got it. Okay, so let's see how far in we can get. So it's a little hard to control. And I don't know really what orientation I'm in once I'm in there. But you can kind of see that we're able to see some stuff. So... There's some capacitors and resistors and some wiring and things that there's no way you'd be able to see that without something like this to get in there or taking it apart, of course. Now that we've got the camera all tested out and working on a Windows laptop, let's test it out on this smartphone. This smartphone happens to be a Samsung Galaxy S4. This particular phone is getting close to three years old, I'd say. The model itself is probably closer to four years old, so it's not exactly the most current phone out there, but it does run most of the current apps, so it ought to be compatible with this camera. So the first step in the instructions for the smartphone is to go to the Android Play Store and search for and install the MocoView app. So you can see I'm in the Play Store, I've already done the search. And in my case, this is the first one that comes up. And you may also be able to see that I've already installed it. If you don't have this installed on your phone, you'll need to do that now. The next thing that we need to do is get the Wi-Fi module and turn it on by holding the power button down for about a second until the lights turn on. Once it's on, we're going to want to wait about 10 to 15 seconds for the Wi-Fi transmitter to initialize. When I first tried this out on my phone, I was able to get the Wi-Fi module to connect to my phone. It would stay connected for about 30 seconds, and then it would automatically disconnect. Now, it doesn't say anything about that in the instructions, but what I found was that I had to go into the deeper settings in my phone here 
and enable the network for this device to be persistent. So if you're having the same intermittent Wi-Fi problem that I was having, you may want to try this on your phone. This procedure may vary a little bit depending on which version of Android you have. This particular version happens to be 5.01. So if you have a different version, the steps may be a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is pull down my scroll menu and I'm going to go into settings and then I'm going to go into my more networks option. Then I'm going to go into the mobile networks tab and then I'm going to go into connection optimizer and once I get into connection optimizer I'm going to go to the unmanaged Wi-Fi networks option. And once I'm here, I can then go into the Add Wi-Fi Networks button. That'll bring up a dialog box. And then what we can do is we can push this button for a list of Wi-Fi networks that are available to add. Now, I'm not going to go through that process because once I open that up, you'll see some personal information that I'd rather not share. But suffice it to say that this network here that's listed, it's just kind of a bunch of letters and numbers, is the network that is being provided by this device. And that's the one that you're going to want to click on and add to the list. Once you've got it added to the list, you can simply back out of the settings and you should be good to go. This network should then be persistent. In other words, once you connect to it, the phone should stay connected to it and not drop it. So now that I have the Wi-Fi module powered up and ready to go, and I've got the Wi-Fi network added to my list of persistent Wi-Fi networks, I should be able to connect to it. My phone currently is connected to Wi-Fi, but that's my home network. I want to change that connection so that it connects to this so that I can use it. So I would do that by scrolling down the top menu there, and then I can just push and kind of hold on this Wi-Fi icon until the list of networks comes up. Then I would simply tap on the network that's listed for this and then it should automatically connect. Now if this is the first time that you're doing it, you will need to enter a password and you'll note in the instructions that the password is simply 12345678. Now I'm not going to show that exact process on here because I've got a list of Wi-Fi networks on there that are uh, personal networks and belong to friends and family and I'd just rather not show that on the video. So. So I won't show that step on the video, but I will now connect to the Wi-Fi module. Okay, so I've connected my phone to the Wi-Fi camera module, and now I'll plug the camera itself in to the port closest to the power button. So we should be almost ready to go here. Now all I need to do is launch the Moco app, and we should start seeing some images. Okay, and there you go. You should be able to see the camera image there. So as you can see, it seems to be working pretty well on the phone here now. In fact, I think the resolution on the phone is better than it was on the PC. Now that could partially be because the screen is compacted down into a smaller form factor, so we're not trying to blow up an image that really shouldn't be blown up larger than it, than it was, but it just does seem to be a little bit crisper. Now I think part of that is the fact that on this Android app we have the ability by pushing this settings button to change the resolution between 640p and 720p. So if we change that over to 640 if it cooperate, there we go. You can see things get a little bit grainier but it's still not too bad. Let's see what happens when I switch it over to 720. So I think the image is a little bit sharper, but the refresh rate is maybe a little bit slower. Maybe not. Maybe it's not too bad. But either way, you can see that it seems to be working okay. Okay, so just as a point of comparison, I've brought the Drake radio back. So let's go inside and see what we can see and see if it looks any different than it did on the PC. So again, we're still dealing with the fact that if I get too close to an object, it goes out of focus. But it looks like overall the picture is better 
on the phone and like I said before the refresh rate is better so we can kind of move things around without getting too seasick. Here's the ball bearings on the back of the tuning knob again. I don't think I've got the camera quite at the same angle I did before. You can see they're not quite as in focus as they were on the other version. Oh, there we go. Now I've got the right angle. So let's take a look inside the bottom of the chassis and see what things look like in there. So there's what it looks like on the bottom of the chassis, and that looks pretty good to me. It looks a lot better than it did on the Windows PC. And like I said before, the refresh rate is much better, so you can kind of move the camera around and not get seasick. But you can get right in there. You can read the values on those capacitors, and you can even see the number on the back of that pot that's there. Um, really clear. Actually, I'm surprised the radio is so clean on, on the inside, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, that's not too bad. Let's take a look at the options that are available on this app now. All of the available features on this app are available on the Windows program as well, except for the resolution setting. I wasn't able to find that in the Windows program. So pushing this icon here will allow us to record video from the camera. So now whatever the camera sees, that's what will be recorded. And then I tap it again to stop the recording. If I want to take a still shot, I just push this button and it'll act like a regular digital camera. It even gives you a shutter noise there so you know that you've taken a picture. And then if I press this button, this allows me to review the pictures and the video that we took. Okay, so then once I'm in here, I can just tap on whichever item I want to look at. There's some pictures. I can scroll through them. Of course, they're all the same since I didn't move the camera. And then there's a little trash can down there that allows me to delete them if I want to. Okay, so then tapping on the video allows you to play it. So if you just tap on that, it should play the video. Now, I didn't really move the camera around, so it probably isn't going to really do much. <laughs> but there is a little icon here. I'm not going to click it, but... Um, if you click that icon, it comes up with a list of Wi-Fi devices that you could stream the video to. So you can play it on your phone, or if you have a Roku or a wireless TV or something like that, you could uh, connect to that and just broadcast right to that. So I think that pretty much covers the setup and operation on both a Windows PC and an Android phone. I do not have an iPhone to test this on, but I assume that it's going to work similarly on an iPhone as it will on an Android. So now that we know the camera is working and we know sort of how to use it, let's do a little more in-depth testing with it. So the first thing I'll talk about are these little accessories that were supplied with the camera. There is what I believe is a little mirror. This here is sort of a magnet and spring clip thing. And then here is just a little hook. Okay, so to install one of these attachments, what I'm going to first do is slide the sleeve over the camera body and past the camera. Then I'll take the attachment, and you can see that it's got a bent end with a hook on it. And that hook fits into a little hole that is on the very back end of the camera body. There's a hole on one side and a hole on the opposite side. Presumably one side is top and one is bottom. I'm not sure which at the moment. Anyway, what we then do is bring the sleeve up and slide it over the bent end there and over where it clipped into the camera body and it just kind of holds it in place that way. So now you can see that with that mirror attachment, the camera can kind of look behind itself. So that may be useful if you're trying to look, I don't know, say down inside of an engine or something and the camera is just at the wrong angle. Let's test it in the radio again. So you can kind of see inside the radio there, you can see some wires in the mirror. So this isn't the highest quality mirror in the world, it's just a piece of shiny metal, but it does give you the ability to see sort of behind the camera if that's what you need to do. So the other supplied attachments are this magnet end, which you could use to stick the camera on something and kind of keep it in place, I suppose. So you were inside of a, a steel pipe or, well, even inside my old radio, if I wanted to keep the camera in a specific spot, this may be a good way to do it. And then they also give you just a plain old hook end, 
And I suppose, you know, if you had the camera and you needed to kind of keep it in a place where you could hook it, this would be useful for that. Or if you just simply needed to retrieve an item, you didn't even need to use the, the uh, camera at all. If you just needed to snake something out of a pipe or something, you may be able to use this hook to do that. The lighting is a little dark in here, but another test that I thought of for the endoscope is to look down in the cylinder head of my old 1981 Honda CM400. We should be able to get the camera in there and at least look at the top of the piston and maybe we'll get be able to see the, uh, the side of the bore as well. Because the endoscope is wireless, I can leave the cell phone over here on the bench. Then I can hit record so that I capture uh, everything that I see here. And now I'll go check out the bore and I'll post this part of the video from the app itself so that you guys can see exactly what the cell phone saw. Hopefully you guys were able to see the top of the piston and the side of the cylinder bore there a little bit in that video. Now that we have the endoscope working good on my mobile phone, let's do a little testing here. Uh, we're looking at the front wheels on my 2004 Chevy Tahoe. I'm going to use the camera to kind of take a look at the brakes and see what they look like. So what I'll do now is I'll hit record on the app here on the smartphone and I should be able to record my session here. And then uh, I'll put, post that as part of the video so you can see exactly what the camera is seeing. That's going to wrap up our review of the wireless endoscope. If this is something that you'd be interested in purchasing, you can find a link to the Amazon product page in the description below. You'll also find a 15% discount code that you can apply to your Amazon order. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to leave a comment or subscribe, feel free to do that as well. Thanks for watching.